to type on here? Well, listen, we want to uh, certainly um, say welcome to everyone this morning. We really appreciate you spending some time with us this morning. And hopefully this is something that uh, uh, is of interest. You know, being the extension agent here in Fort Bend County for um, Agriculture and Natural Resources, always looking for um, always looking for what interests people, what, what folks need to be educated on. And, you know, we've, although we've been somewhat closed down throughout the summer, uh, facility wise, we have folks that'll come in, you know, come into the, the front uh, area there and bring an insect in and we get quite a few of these and this is pr generally they're bringing in what's the cicada killer and I don't want to, I don't want to steal um, Dr. Puckett's num uh, uh, thunder by each nine deal, but you know, it, it's, it's, they've all been that, but, but folks just, they're not sure and I you know the media does a darn good, good um, job of, of really getting word out there and sometimes you know, it, it can kind of scare you and make you wonder, well, is this what I've got in my backyard or not? So this, that, those experiences that I've had this summer, just working with the public on identifying insects, and this one in particular, just led, led me to um, try something a little bit new and said, let's just throw this out there and um, let's, let's educate our, our, our public and our, and, and our stakeholders and our, and our folks on on uh, what this really is. So I reached out to Dr. Puckett and he was so very kind to say, yes, I would be absolutely wonderful. It would be absolutely wonderful to do something like this. So um, without much further ado, I just want to say uh, thanks again to everyone. And that, Dan, if you just logged on, um, thank you for, for logging on. Um, it'd be a fairly short uh, presentation, but we'd have left some time in there. So if you have questions along the way, type it into the chat. And I'll be looking at the chat, and um, uh, Dr. Puckett will be as well. And uh, but but um, if we don't we don't want to miss anyone's questions, so please, there's no such thing as a, a, a as a dumb or stupid question. Um, ask, please ask, and uh, we will certainly uh, hopefully get everything uh, answer all the questions that you, you need to know today. So well. Uh, with us this afternoon, this afternoon, this morning is, is Dr. Robert Puckett. He is a Department of Entomology, uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension um, sp specialist with us with the Department of Entomology. Um, and uh, we are just happy to have him with us. And, and Robert, I'm going to turn it over to you at this time. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Philip. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so thrilled you're all here uh, to talk about the Asian giant hornet. Um, as, as Philip mentioned, if you have questions, um, as I'm moving through these slides, I like to be very interactive during my presentations. And sometimes that can be a bit of a challenge when we're doing it on Zoom or <clears throat> any of the other um, meeting sharing apps that are available. But type, a, type a, a question in if you've got it. Philip's going to be scanning those. It's, it's, sometimes it's kind of difficult for the speaker to see those as they pop in. Um, but but he'll 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 stop me and don't hesitate to stop me if you if you have a question or if if there's something I, I um, kind of move too quickly over um, please please ask questions because I, I know a lot of folks have questions about these insects um, so so yeah I'll tell you a little bit about myself so um, uh, I'm I'm extension faculty based in in College Station um, at the university. And I am an entomologist, and, and I work on a variety of, of insect species that occur around, we call them urban insects, urban insect pests, so the insects that we find in and around our homes. And, and, and my real specialty is working on insects, social insects um, that are invasive. So those insects that have come to the United States from somewhere else in the world. So I work primarily on ants, so red imported fire ants, and now the tawny crazy ant, or raspberry crazy ant, as you may know them, um, as well as um, a couple of species of termites, one of which is invasive, so the Formosan subterranean termite. So, so I spend a lot of time thinking about invasion biology and the problems that invasive insects cause us when, when they arrive in the United States, and, and in particular in Texas. And so um, when when the news sort of broke this spring about um, the Asian giant hornet, um, otherwise known as the murder hornet, you may know him by that name too. You won't hear me say that very often um, because I think it's sort of a sensationalized common name uh, for these insects. I, I tend to refer to him as the Asian giant hornet. Uh, but, but anyway, when, when they arrived in, in the US, 
and the, actually when the press caught on to this in, in, uh, in the spring of, of 2020, the news broke and people became very interested um, in, in these insects. And, and like, like Philip said, the press can sometimes be a little bit scary. You know, the, the press in this case did a very good job of being the press, right? They got people's attention um, by referring to these guys as murder hornets. And I, I hope to dispel a couple of myths about these guys over the course of the next uh, few slides and talk a little bit about their biology. I first came became aware of these back when I was in graduate school, back in the uh, early aughts. Um, and there, there was, a, so at the time that I, I learned about them um, during uh, coursework, there was also a, a, a Nat Geo um, documentary about these guys. And, and I, I was just blown away by their biology. So these, these guys are bee hunters. And, and you'll notice in my title here, this sort of uh, quirky uh, spelling of bee. The question is, how concerned would she, would we, should we be about these insects? Well, it depends. Um, depends on where you are. Um, depends on the activities that you engage in in your life. And, and also, if you in, engage in anything that has to do with pollinator species, such as bees, which happens to be all of us, right? So, so these guys are, are um, adapted for hunting colonies, other colonies of social insects, in particular bees. Um, and and that, that documentary that I mentioned was really interesting because it, it showed sort of their elegant hunting biology. So these guys will go out and, and hunt down colonies of honeybees. Now in this case, um, they were in Japan and they were hunting Japanese honeybees, which are slightly different from our European honeybees that we have in the United States. But so the uh, a, a hornet would go out and it would seek a colony of bees. And once it did, it would mark the colony with a pheromone. So this was a scout hornet and it would return and gather its nest mates, other hornets. And so this, basically a wolf pack of hornets would go out and, and, and go to the side of that honeybee colony, whether it was a, a commercial honeybee colony in a bee box or a, a wild colony in, the, you know, a, a, in, a, in a hollow of a tree somewhere. And, and once they uh, found that colony of bees again, they would begin to um, attack the bees. So the bees would come out of their colony and, and immediately they were attacked by hornets and the hornets would literally lop off their heads, the honeybee head. And over the course of several hours, they would exhaust the, the worker bee population in the colony. Then they would enter and then attack the, the pupae and the larvae in the colony, return those to their nest and essentially destroying the bee colony. So you can imagine we all have a, a relationship with pollinator species, right? If you eat food, which I suspect most of you do, you have a, a relationship with bees and other pollinator species. So from, from a concern perspective, we're, we're very concerned about what, these, what this invasive species could do to pollinator populations in the United States. And in particular, how that could impact um, production agriculture. And so um, the, our governor, Governor Abbott and, and his folks, when they learned about this new invasion of these hornets, they decided to become proactive and, and they reached out to the university, to the vice chancellor's office and said, hey, we, we need some folks in Texas that are experts on different aspects of, of entomology and agriculture and, and production agriculture and pollinator services to be thinking about how we position uh, against this invasive species if it makes its way to Texas. And at present, uh, we only know them to occur in northwestern Washington state, which is good news because, you know, right now these, these animals, as far as we know, are some 1800 miles away from where I'm sitting right now in, in my office in College Station. So that's the good news. But it's, it's wise um, to be proactive about these things and be thinking about what we will do if and when these insects show up in Texas. And so what I first want to do is walk through um, how, how we identify this insect. So when you see a large wasp um, in your environment, do you need to be concerned about the fact that we know that these hornets have entered the United States? Is this one of these insects? And so you, you would be, I think you would be shocked to know how many emails and phone calls um, I've received since spring um, regarding these insects, people that believe that they've seen um, an Asian giant hornet. It's, it's been absolutely remarkable. I'm gonna share some of that information with you here shortly. Um, so let's get rolling here. Let me see if I can change my slide. Okay, so in terms of um, identifying Asian giant hornets, the, the first thing to keep in mind 
is that these are very large insects, very large wasps. Um, so, so over two inches in length, they're very robust. You can see they've got a very robust abdomen and thorax, and, and actually their head is large too, as, as uh, hornets and wasps go. And I'll show you some pictures for comparison. Um, so so there's, lots of, there's lots of wasps and some bees um, that resemble in, in some way the Asian giant hornet. And so the first thing to think about looking at if, if you found a, a wasp or you've killed a wasp and you believe it may be these insects is to take a look and actually look between the thorax and the abdomen or the gaster. And if you see a constriction, some, some people refer to it as a waste, a constriction that these arrows are pointing out, that can give you an indication that you're dealing with a wasp, but that can also fool you because there are wasps that don't have a narrow constriction. Um, so, so for instance, these sawflies, it, it, if you can see my cursor circling this guy and this one and this one, um, the constriction in their waist or between their abdomen and thorax is not as dramatic as that that you see on this slide, right, of our actual Asian giant hornet. Um, and, and in fact, this is a, a, an Asian giant hornet here. And you can, and, and I think your eye can pick out the size differential. So this is the largest insect on this slide and they are larger than almost all of the wasps and hornets that, that we have in, in North America. So, so for instance, this is uh, what we typically refer to as a yellow jacket. This is a paper wasp. This is a true yellow jacket. These insects are much larger than the wasps that we're familiar with kind of working around our houses, except for the cicada killer. And I, I, uh, Philip mentioned these earlier. This, so, so <laughs> it was funny when, when, um, when Governor Abbott created his task force, I should have mentioned this earlier, I'm, I'm part of that task force. And when we had our first meetings to discuss this, I thought, you know, our cicada killer populations are in trouble because this is a, these are cicada killers and they're a very common insect in our environment. But I thought pe people are gonna misidentify these for the Asian giant hornet. And in fact, they have, and I've gotten hundreds of images of either cicada killers that people have killed or have happened to take a picture of as they were flying through the yard or ones that died in their yard. People have really been whacking these guys thinking that they're Asian giant hornets. And that's unfortunate because actually while our cicada killers can sting us, they're solitary insects. Um, they're solitary wasps and they're not very defensive. I mean, you, you really got to put them in the right mood to get them to sting you. Um, but nonetheless, let, let's take a look at the characters that separate our Asian giant hornet from our cicada killer wasp. So the first thing to remember is that these are very similar in size. So, so I understand why people misidentify them. Um, and, and they're a wasp and people know a wasp when they see them. So they see big wasp and it's got stripes on its abdomen and they think this must be this, this invasive species. Um, but there's some, some subtle and not so subtle differences. So, so one of the things um, to note here, if you look at the coloration difference between the head of the Asian giant hornet and the thorax, they're very different. There's a great deal of contrast between this sort of orange head of the AGH or Asian giant hornet and its thorax, which is very dark. But if you look, we've got several subspecies of cicada killer wasps and, and their heads. So we, th this one, of course, has a dark head compared to its thorax. This one has a light brown head, which is, um, oh, excuse me, a, a dark head just as its thorax appears. This one has a light brown head and a light brown thorax and so on. So that's a big difference. Um, the other thing to note is the difference in the, the um, light bands on the abdomen of the Asian giant hornet. If you'll note, they're complete across the dorsal or upper side of the, the abdomen. So there's no real gap in between the two sides of these stripes, right? But if you look at our cicada killer, there's a dramatic gap between the bands of color on this guy. And if you look at this one, there's, um, there's a line that separates the, the two sides of the yellow coloration on the abdomen of these guys. And same with this one. So, so that's, a, that's a big diagnostic character. If, if the bands are not complete and stretched completely across the abdomen, you're not dealing with an Asian giant hornet. Um, but as I mentioned, these have been misidentified many, many times in, in Texas, and I'm sure throughout the United States for Asian giant hornets. So there, here's a, a parade of photographs of, of cicada killers that have been emailed to me, um, all of which were killed. Well, except for one, this one ha happened. Oh, you know what? That, so this person actually got a nice photograph of, of a cicada killer while it was flying. 
but then um, whack it with a, a tennis racket and killed it. And then I got a picture of it after it had been uh, dispatched of. So, so anyway, our cicada killer populations are really taking it on the chin this summer as people misidentified them for Asian giant hornets. Um, so this is probably my favorite misidentification um, that I've received so far. So this went into a county extension office and this person was adamant um, that she had discovered a, a murder bee <clears throat> and uh, that she'd killed it and gotten some photographs for us. Um, turns out this is a beetle. Um, it's, it's a very large beetle, um, but a beetle nonetheless and, and, and not even closely related to our Asian giant hornet. So there are lots of unfortunate insects that have become misidentified for Asian giant hornets this summer and have been killed as a result of the misidentification. And then we've also uh, become aware of a number of, of uh, people attempting to convince other people that they have found an Asian giant hornet and doing it through some nefarious means. And so this is, um, this is a social media post. A person um, uh, posted that they believe that they had found a murder hornet um, and, and they live in North Texas. And so a person on the on the thread was asking, well, could it be a, or this person was asking, could it be a European hornet, which do occur in the United States, but they're, they're east of us. Um, and, and the person actually convinced uh, this person on the thread that it, yes, indeed, this was an Asian giant hornet. And they'd taken this picture, of course, in North Texas. Well, with just a little bit of sleuthing around on the web, Dr. Mike Merchant up in the Dallas office got to the bottom of this. So um, this is a Korean website. <clears throat> at a botanical garden. Um, you can see that the person on this thread had stolen this photograph from this website and um, posted it as their own. So that's unfortunate. And it just, you know, these sorts of things just add to the hysteria, which is bad news. But we want people to be aware of these and to be looking for them. But we don't want, you know, we, we have to spend our time tracking this down and making sure if this is in fact true, um, which is, it's time consuming and kind of annoying. Um, this just arrived um, just recently uh, to our vice chancellor's office and then it, it came down to us and they said, well, is this real or a fake? And it's, you know, this is one of those, those situations where just looking at the photo, it, it doesn't look quite real. And then one of our, our folks um, uh, discovered that there is an app. This is, this is a photograph that he developed um, that allows you to insert this hornet into photographs and then you know, share them as your own or whatever you want to do with them. So unfortunately, this person was trying to pull the wool over our eyes and say, look, I found this, this insect in North Texas. It was flying around while I was sitting on my back porch looking out at the backyard. So this is kind of a pain and kind of unfortunate, but at the same time, it's kind of amusing. Um, so, but what we want to do is spend our time today talking about real Asian giant hornets. And, and so um, let's get into this. I want to start and talk just a bit about their biology. Um, and then we'll talk about their behavior and then talk about what we know about them um, in terms of where they occur in the United States and, and what folks are doing about them where they're known to occur. Um, so these are hornets, as I've mentioned, and, and hornets belong to the order Hymenoptera. And the order Hymenoptera has all of our bees, ants, and wasps. So um, most of our social insects occur in, in this order. And, and of course, these, these Asian giant hornets are truly social insects, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, they belong to the family Vespidae, and there's about 5,000 species worldwide that, are, that occur in that family. So yellow, think yellow jackets, hornets, paper wasps, potter wasps, mason wasps, um, and the like. So, so within that family, there's, there's many uh, genera, and, and the genus that um, our Asian giant hornets belong to is Vespa. Um, so we, we have 23 species of Vespa worldwide. Um, two of those now occur in the United States. Before the Asian giant hornets um, made their way to the U.S., Vespa crabro, um, the European hornet, as I mentioned earlier, was, had established in eastern North America. So we've got a couple of these guys now moving around um, in the U.S. They're eusocial, and, and eusocial is just like, it's, it's kind of a $10 word for truly social insects, and, and, and the criteria that have to be met there are that the species has cooperative brood care. So think like fire ants have workers that, that go out and forage and they bring food back and feed it to the brood, um, the next generation of ants in the colony. Same with our hornets and, and social wasps. Um, and they also have a um, 
a division of, of um, uh, the reproduction among the colony. So some, some individuals, in the most of the individuals in the colony are not reproductively capable, but we do have kings and queens um, that can reproduce. Um, and so I'll move through to the next slide here. Let's, um, so, so this is, these are some good photographs of our Asian giant hornet. You've seen these, both of these photographs already in this slide set. Um, they do, like, like most insects that are commonly known, they have several different common names depending on where you are in the world. So the Asian giant hornet, Japanese hornet, the yak killer hornet, and the giant sparrow bee, which it happens to be my favorite of those. Um, so where are they known to occur? So their native range is in Asia, um, and, and, and uh, they're most commonly found in, in Japan and Korea, as these maps indicate. And generally, you, they're found in subtropic to moderate temperatures, temperate zones, and they're not common in humid tropics. And, and the reality is they're most often found in um, lowland mountain regions. Now, the good news for Texans is that we don't have a lot of those regions, right? So our habitat doesn't closely match that which, um, in, in which they thrive, which is, is good news um, for us. So I guess the, the $100 question that's not been addressed here and the one that everybody always asks me is, are they going to make it to Texas? And if they do, um, are they going to be able to survive? And the answer to that is, we don't know, right? So is it likely that, the, that one of these hornets, um, a reproductively capable queen, can make her way to Texas? Well, maybe. Um, we, we have a lot of invasive species in our state that have come here from elsewhere, and they do so along human commerce routes. So we take invasive species around with us. We just inadvertently move them. You know, these wasps came, the hornets came from Southeast Asia and made their way across um, uh, the Pacific Ocean to the Pacific Northwest. So could they hitch a ride on some cargo or materials that come down to Texas from the Pacific Northwest? Well, the answer to that is yes, they could. Is that likely? I think it's somewhat unlikely, especially now because the population is not very robust up in um, the Northwestern United States. Now that can change. Um, following up on that question, if they make it to Texas, can they survive? Well, it sort of depends on the system that they find themselves in. Um, and so, so there is, I think at, at present, there's very little likelihood that they will make it to the state. And I think there's less likelihood that they could establish and survive. But if, but if a colony did move um, workers and all, then that does create at least um, some danger for the folks around the area that they find themselves in. Um, in, in terms of their life cycle, so they've got an interesting life cycle. It's not unlike um, most of our um, social wasps. So the, the mated queens from the previous year, when it gets cold, they overwinter. So they're mated, they're inseminated, they're ready to go when warm weather returns. And, and they typically under overwinter um, in the soil or in sheltered places. A lot of our, our paper wasps or um, social wasps here in, in our part of the world will overwinter under bark, loose bark, either on trees or fallen limbs um, in crags and soil. And that's what these guys do. So when it becomes warm, Remember, they, they've already mated the previous year. When it becomes warm, they become active and they start building their colony, building their nest, excavating um, in the soil or wherever they decide to build their nest. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. And then they start laying eggs and the colony begins to grow in the, in the spring of that year. Um, and during the, the late spring, early summer, colony growth continues, the worker load becomes high in the colonies and they can assume all of the sort of the work of the colony. The queen no longer has to forage for herself. They're bringing her food, they're feeding her brood, her offspring. And then um, somewhere mid to late summer, we're, we're reaching m maximum colony size. So the maximum number of workers that are gonna be produced in that season. And, and at this point, they start becoming hunters. And so they'll go out and occasionally um, prey on bees at, at honeybee colonies. And that, and that may be wild colonies. It may be um, uh, commercial colonies. So this is when um, beekeepers traditionally start to notice these wasps around. Um, and so a little bit later in the year, this is when sort of this group predation that I described earlier begins to happen. So these wolf packs of of Asian giant hornets are going out, locating colonies of bees, and, and then destroying them, destroying the workers and returning to their nest with the larvae and, and, and pupae of the growing colony of bees. 
And of course, this is very detrimental to the bee colony. It doesn't take many wasps to do this, just a handful. Um, so then um, as we get into the later part of the year, there, there's this die off of workers, um, the emergence of the next reproductive brood from the colony that go out and, and mate. And then those queens that are mated go find a place to, to, to overwinter, just as the previous cycle that I show you before happened. Um, and then they'll be lying in wait to start new colonies the following spring. Now, um, in terms of dispersal distance of those mated queens um, in the fall of the year, it's kind of unknown for this species. However, there are other related species that have been studied and you know, folks have done mark recapture studies where they found them 18 or so miles away from the original parent colony. So they can disperse quite long distances, um, or at least we presume they can. Um, in terms of their nesting habits, what are they looking for? So they they build nests typically underground. So they'll begin to excavate excavate soil in, in craggy areas, um, and they'll build their nests there. Sometimes um, underneath root balls of trees and hollow trunks of, of trees, typically that have fallen, um, and, and even in rodent and, and other burrowing animal nests. So the um, one good a bit of good news about these guys is that they very rarely nest in a, above ground hollows and trees. And the, the, if you think about insects that do that, especially social insects, if you think about, you know, honeybees typically will enter homes. Um, they make their way in through a, a weep hole and, and work their way into a wall void and build their nest there. And that's problematic for homeowners. Um, the good news is that these, these hornets don't tend to do that. So we probably don't have to worry about if they ever made their way to Texas and established, we don't have to worry about them nesting inside our walls and our homes. Um, uh, Robert? Yes. Yeah, I, that, I just want to make sure, I, uh, Jimmy had a question and yeah. I, I think that answered it. I don't know if you've seen that or not. Pardon me for interrupting. I know we had- No, I'm, I'm glad you did. I didn't see the question. Yeah, yeah you just said, do, does uh, Asian, uh, Asian giant hornets burrow into the ground? Similar to some hornets I observed. So. Yes, I don't know. yes, that, that is their, <laughs> that's their instinct, Jimmy, is to, to um, burrow in the ground and hollow out a nesting site. And then you, as you see here, this, this person's carrying the multi-tiered nest of this, this one colony of Asian giant hornets. And he's wearing some pretty serious personal protection equipment. This is not your standard beekeeper suit. This is uh, a leather suit built to withstand the stings of, of this this insect, and you can see they're very large compared to this human's arm and shoulder. Um, they preferred forested habitats, as I mentioned before, um, typically lowland uh, mountainous forests. Um, and, and as I said before, the good news is we don't have a lot of that here. <clears throat> okay, so I mentioned their foraging habits a couple of times. Um, em emerged queens, though, when they first emerge in the spring, they're looking for carbohydrate rich sources of food. Um, typically sap. And this, this sort of plays into our means of surveilling for these insects. And I'll talk about this here in a minute in terms of what they're doing up in Washington State. Um, the workers, however, need protein. And they need protein from other insects. And that's why um, uh, the, 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 the hornets are going out and feeding on things like honeybees, beetles, other large insects. And that's why they raid colonies for those insects. Um, and they can forage quite long distances, um, up to five miles. So if you think about wherever you are sitting right now in the world, just imagine something that's about five miles away. It's pretty dramatic. I mean, that's a long distance. And they can call nestmates to that, to the site of something that they found that, that long distance away. Um, however, they typically spend their time within about a mile of the colony, which is good news that we know this, right? Because if somebody finds a worker, uh, a, a hornet at a, you know, at a, at a bee colony that they're tending, um, then we can surmise that the, the main colony is, you know, probably somewhere between one and, you know, less than a mile up to five miles away, um, which is actually kind of a large area when you think about it. But the good news is that they're not, it's not a much larger area and we can hope to, to find where they're occurring and destroy the colony, which they've been able to do in some instances in Washington state. And I'll talk about that here in a minute. So I mentioned this hunting phase of uh, hornets. They'll go out and catch bees and return to their nest. Um, but there is this, this other phase of hunting that I've, I've, I've mentioned, the slaughter phase, where these groups of, of hornets will go out and, and identify a nest of bees that are a colony of bees and then begin to attack and destroy the, the bee colony. And this is the aftermath of one of those raids on a commercial bee box. These are all decapitated um, honeybee workers. 
so so eventually they'll they'll go into the they'll go into the colony and begin to kill the the larvae and brood as well. And, and as I mentioned several times, this destroys a bee colony. This is bad bad news and very concerning for apiculturalists around the United States. <clears throat> and it only takes a few hornets, as I mentioned, up to twenty hornets can destroy a a, a, a mature uh, honeybee hive. So in terms of their impacts and concerns on human health, I've talked a lot about our concerns about bee populations um, and populations of other arthropods. Um, but of course, we're, we're more concerned, of course, about our, our human health as it pertains to these wasps. And I want to I want to start this discussion by saying that we lose people, unfortunately, lose people to, to insect stings every year. This is not something that we're unfamiliar with. Just last week, I, I had a, a widow of a man who was killed by a few bee stings, honey bee stings, reached out to me for some information. So this happens, and, and we know that we lose people to things like fire ants every year. So, so people have um, different levels of reaction to um, insect toxins. And, and that's the case with these, these hornets as well. So, um, but from an individual that doesn't succumb and die from the stings of these wasps, the, the sting can be worse than what we're familiar with in terms of being stung by insects in North America. Um, Systemic shock, anaphylactic shock is always a concern when, when anybody is stung by any species of Hymenoptera, as I mentioned. And we're concerned about that with these guys too, not differentially so, um, but, but certainly concern. These insects, um, Asian giant hornets, deliver a large dose of venom when they sting. Um, they typically, however, only sting if they're handled or if they're defending their nest. Right, so they're like other social wasps. If you disturb their nests, they're going to disturb you as well. I mean, they're going to return the favor, and you're going to be stung. Um, and and also um, along those lines, when when a when a group of of these hornets has identified a, a honeybee colony that that they're going to destroy, they become very defensive of that resource. So they will they will respond to disturbance in that situation just as they would if you had disturbed their main colony. So this is something else that apiculturalists certainly in Washington State have to become uh, aware of. Beekeepers in Washington State have have received this message from their um, extension professionals in their state that that listen if you're if you're out at your colonies and you, and you walk up on a bee box and something looks strange don't go investigating. You know, if you think they might be under attack, leave them alone because you're going to be stung. Um, and our typical bee suits are not going to prevent those stings. Hey, so, um, um, uh, yes. Hey, Phil. Robert. Yeah. Um, Bob had a question. I uh, referred back says, where is this bee colony? I guess was that, Bob, were you, re were, were, it, it, were you referring to something that uh, Dr. Puckett was, was talking about earlier? I'll bet he was asking about this colony. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, so this, these are photographs that were provi provided to me by Washington State, the Was Washington State Department of Agriculture. And as, as I recall, this image was, th these were European honeybees, but in Asia. So they've been attacked in Asia. If that okay. answers your question, Bob. So, so one of the things about these guys is that, you know, while mass attacks are pretty rare, um, when it happens, it, it can be very destructive to the human that is being attacked. So they can, these things can be crippling if you receive enough of them. Um, and, and oftentimes there's localized tissue necrosis. I've got a kind of a nasty picture here. In rare incidences, there can be organ failure as a result of a large number of stings. So this is a, a person's arm, and he had been stung a number of times by, by these hornets. And you can see there's a lot of, of um, tissue necrosis and cell death around the side of the sting. Um, so, so anyway, I'll get off of that picture. That's gross. So, so where do these guys occur? What are they doing now in the US? So this is sort of the history of, of what we know of them up in the Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> so they, they were first discovered actually in British Columbia in Nanaima. Um, and, and there was an active colony that was found and destroyed. That was in September of 2019. And this is when, like, you know, as entomologists, we kind of caught wind of this. We heard about it sort of through the grapevine. There was no real press about it. But we had, we had heard that, that they had been discovered uh, up in British Columbia. Well, shortly after that, in December of, of in, in, in the same year of last year, 2019, um, there was a person in Blaine, Washington, that, that believed that they had found an individual, a single wasp, single hornet, 
And in fact, that was confirmed by the Washington State Department of Agriculture. <clears throat> um, and that was confirmed just four days later. So it didn't take them long to confirm the identification. Um, sightings were also then reported um, in the Vancouver area. And so here's a map of, of where we know them to occur so far. So four wasp sightings in the Pacific North, in, in Washington State, and then a couple in, in British Columbia. Okay, so I mentioned that nest that was destroyed in BC. And then there was a, what is presumed to have been a bee kill, an actual colony kill in Custer, Washington um, last year, but, but it, that's unconfirmed. Um, and then there were reports of attacks on hives in the Bellingham, Washington area. So rack four, a little bit um, closer to present time, uh, the Washington State Department of Agriculture started trapping and surveilling for these wasps. And they, they caught their first wasp, a worker, um, in July of 2020, just, just this year, this summer. Um, in July, uh, later in July, July 29th, the first male wasp was trapped. Now this is, this is important because remember their life cycle. They don't produce reproductively capable males and females. All the males are reproductively capable. Um, they don't produce those typically late in the year, like they expected to start seeing these much later in the year, closer to now, you know, August and September. Um, but this happened earlier than they imagined. Um, but the good news is their traps are working, so they, 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 they can rely on this surveillance tool. And so what will they do when they found them? Well, what they'll do is um, mark the site, use a GIS to then delimit based on how far we know that they can disperse and forage um, and begin to build areas that then they will um, increase their surveillance. So more traps once, once an insect is found with the idea that they can hone in on the site of the colony itself. So this is what those traps look like. Remember I mentioned earlier um, when females emerge in the spring, they, they actually create wounds in trees and feed on sap. Well, they've, um, the, the traps that they're using are exploiting that behavior. This is an artificial um, wound on a tree that creates a sap flow. And then this is a sticky card around it. So when the wasps show up, to, they sense the, they can, they can detect the odor of the sap. And when they go to, to feed on it, they're trapped on this sticky card. And then the other um, traps that they're using are these bottle traps. So we've got the sap traps like, like this one here, um, and then bottle traps. So these are, these are just homemade devices that they're using with, with fermenting material inside that the wasps find attractive they'll go into the container and become trapped. Um, and they learned this from folks that have worked on these, these insects in, in Southeast Asia. Um, so they're targeting queens in the early spring and workers in the late summer and fall. And of course, they're working with um, beekeepers uh, it, it, around the state of Washington to get these traps out. You know, they've only got a small uh, number of people that are working on this problem. They're having to use beekeepers and other organizations as a, a force multiplier to get these surveillance tools out into the environment. And, and once they do, once they, they hope that once they can locate the nest and they're using the traps to find the general area, and then um, they're going and searching in forested areas for the colonies themselves. Because the nice thing about these colonies is they create a heat signature. So this is, this is a photograph here of a colony. This is of the same colony using a FLIR infrared camera. And so you can see the temperature differential inside um, the, the actual colony of the hornets there. So they can scan large areas with these devices. Um, and then once a colony is found, they'll, they'll go in and destroy them. And there's a note here that, that they'll be using special hornet suits uh, to do this work. And this is an example of this hornet suit. You can, you can see this is a very thick material you know, I, as I imagine somebody in the cool of the year up in Washington State working around the forest in one of these, it, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't look pleasant. But then I think about somebody moving around in Texas looking for these hornets in August and September in one of these suits. I, I, I think they're at more danger of heat exhaustion than hornet sting in one of these suits, but who knows. Um, yeah, so one of the things that Washington State is doing is they're very active in their request that stakeholders and and residents that believe that they found one of these colonies do not try to eradicate them and that they do not ask pest control companies to do it because of course the pest control company may be just as unaware as the you know anybody uh, of, of the fact that they may be dealing with these 
hornets because they're so new and that puts them at peril. Um, this is not a typical wasp um, management job as it, as it relates to uh, commercial pest control. So they say stay about 10 feet away from a, a colony or hive that's being attacked um, for, their sa for the person's safety that's making the observations. And then they're actually um, uh, actively posting guidelines for, for building your own trap. So, so they're, they're reaching out to the citizenry of the state for help in, in deploying traps around the state to look for these wasps. So they're taking it very seriously. At this point in time, I don't think we have to be as, as active as this. I think, you know, I was thinking about an analogy here and I think it, I was thinking about our, 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 um, our tornado warning system, right? We've got tornado watches and warnings and a tornado watch is when conditions are sort of ripe for a tornado to form. So we're, we're surveilling for tornadic um, activity in a, in a weather system, in a frontal system when we've got a watch out and when there's a warning, we've detected rotation or there's a, there's a tornado on the ground. We're definitely in the watch phase in Texas. We're watching for these to occur. And, and, and if they do make their way to the state, well then we'll go into you know, Asian giant hornet warning uh, mode and begin to surveil for them. And so what, what we've done in, in Texas is say, listen, if, if, if you guys are concerned about this and we've, we've um, there's been a lot of press releases from the university and the, 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 the Hornet Task Force um, that include this document. So this is um, our Asian giant hornet specimen or photograph submission form. And you, you can go to our website that I'll, I'll provide you here in a minute and find this form. If you believe that you've seen one of these guys, reach out, you can give me a call um, send me an email or reach out to your county extension office um, and, and work with professionals in your county to get those specimens to me and then I can determine if you're actually dealing with an Asian giant hornet or, or if you just if you don't have any reason to be concerned. And here is here's all of my contact information. I'm at the Rollins Urban and Structural Entomology Facility here in College Station. This is our physical address um, and uh, this is uh, all of what different contact information. So my email address, phone number, um, Twitter handle. And then this is our, our, um, our, um, our lab's web address. So urbanentomology.tamu.edu. And you can get me through any one of those means of communication. And don't ever hesitate to reach out if you think you're dealing with these insects or, or honestly any other insect that you might be dealing with that you um, are not sure of the identification. I'm, I'm happy to to identify your insect pests for you. I spent a lot of time doing that. As a matter of fact, there was an envelope sitting on my desk just this morning when I got in to take a look at um, pest control companies sent in some insects that they need identified. So, so think of that as a service that I can provide you and I'll, I'll be happy to do that anytime um, you need it or just need general information about any insect pest. So, so Philip, that's, that's all I've got um, in terms of slides and looks like we've got a little bit of time to chat. If you guys have questions, just pop on and Let's talk. Uh, there is there is one from from Kathy. It says, "Is there difference in size, shape, color between workers and others?" Yeah, uh, definitely. So the the queens are a little bit larger, um, and the males are too. And let me show you a picture of the males. So you're so you've seen a number of pictures of the. So this is a this is a worker. Um, this is a male. Can you guys see that? Are you seeing my screen, Phil? Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can see the males are quite a lot more elongate and less robust um, than, than the workers. The, the queens are a lot more sort of worker shaped, uh, although I don't have a picture of them here, but they're larger. Um, but they're really only active for a short period of time. They, they go out and begin to excavate their nests. They take a meal and that's pretty much it. They start laying eggs and you know, for only a brief window of time are the, the queens moving around. They'll take a little bit of sap from trees and, and then get enough energy to start their first round of, of brood. And once those um, hatch and, and go through their metamorphosis and become workers, she's sort of off, off the hook. The workers are feeding her from that point. So you, I think it's unlikely that they'll, we'll find as many um, reproductive insects as we will workers in traps. Okay. Well, uh, is there anyone else? Uh, feel free to, to step in a chat. Chat here we go. Are they? Oh, here's one here. Um, uh, Dr. Puckett, do they forage around the clock or daytime only? Uh, these are these are um, diurnal 
wasps. So they're foraging during the day. Like okay. most of our wasps, yeah. All right, and then I think we missed one there. Are they all equally aggressive when protecting their nest? Yeah, so these are, these are social insects. And I, I often say about social insects, their behavior tends to be very hardwired from individual to individual and in most cases from colony to colony. So if, if there is a challenge to a colony of these guys, just like a challenge to a mound of fire ants, the workers are going to react in basically identical means. They're, they're, in, in the case of the hornets, they're going to swarm out, they're going to detect the threat, and they're going to sting it. Okay. All right. Well, there's nothing else popping up, and uh, I, I've got um, one more question. You may have recovered it, but I guess to just, just a generalized question is, um, so for the immediate moment and for our future, we we don't there's we don't need to necessarily be greatly greatly concerned <laughs> no. about this about this coming to texas anytime soon is that is that pretty close no, to being I, right i yeah I, I think that's very accurate i would say that we've got far greater things to be concerned about right now and okay uh, yes true yeah i think this should be low on our list however um just just know that there there is a group of us on campus that we're keeping up with all the news and all the movements of these and other state agencies um you know, watching very closely. It's an invasive species, it's established, and it's unlikely that they're gonna wink out for any reason. So they're gonna be part of the reality, especially up in the Northwestern United States. And sure. just like other invasive species, their range is going to expand. We just don't know yet how far it's going to expand. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, well, it looks like we got, uh, there's a few more that's popped up, so this is good. Great. Uh, Great. Yeah, how many total in a usual colony? That's a very good question. Um, so several hundred, um, I, you know, I, the, the reports that, that we have, a bit, you know, these, these have been studied fair, fairly well in, in Asia and, you know, a large colony of these, a few hundred. Remember, they, they only have the one season to grow. Okay. So, so these, are, these are colonies that grow and then crash. Oh, okay. Um, so they're, yeah. they're, they don't just persist on. Right. Okay. <clears throat> okay. All right. Uh, can I... Can I, um, is a preventive spray in root, root canal, root canals, pardon me, I've, I've got to learn to read, folks. Uh, can, I, can I prevent spray in root cavities on my property? I hope yeah. I, okay. Yeah, you, you could, but what I would say from an environmental stewardship standpoint, there's no reason to do that yet. Um, okay. If you think about the, 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 um, the rate at which our conventional insecticides degrade. Um, you could probably only imagine to have a season's worth protection. Um, and, I, and, and the reason why that's important is that, you know, the, it, these wasps may never show up in our part of the world. Um, and if they do, it's certainly gonna be some time before they do. I would imagine several seasons before they do. Um, so that insecticide, if you do it as a preventative, it's going to break down very quickly. Now, if they show up in Texas and they're spreading, then yeah, that could be something we might think about as a, as a recommendation. Right. Okay. Yeah. There's uh, no I'll, reason to treat for these right now. Yeah. No, no reason to be, be super alarmed. But just, just be aware, I guess. Right. That's right. Okay. Well, Chris asked, what are Asian countries doing to control them? Um, well, <laughs> this is an interesting uh, question. So when a colony of these is, is discovered near a human population, they will be removed. Um, but the reality is I've reached out. So I, I have a couple of uh, Asian uh, colleagues in, in Asia, one in Japan in particular. Um, and I said, hey, we need some specimens. Um, we, we, need, we need some specimens of these guys because we, don't, we just don't have any, you know, and, and uh, we, we're going to be talking to the public about these, it'd be nice to be able to show them some, some really nice curated specimens. And so he, he replied to my email and copied a colleague at a university. And the guy said, sure, I'll get them for you this afternoon. They're all over campus. Oh my goodness. <laughs> the, the point is they, they respond to them in the same way we, we respond to like red wasps, right? They're okay. a part of the environment there. And, and their threat to human health is, has been largely overblown um, by the American press. Um, and, but that's fine. I mean, that's, we need to be aware of them and it caught people's fancy and it, it, it's good that there was at least a hook there to get people's attention. Um, but the reality is in the parts of the world where people live with these, 
they're far less concerned about them than we are even in Texas where we're 2,000 miles from them, you know? Um, right. But yeah, they, they will eradicate them if, if they become a threat to human, human health, if they're in situations where there's a colony that's nesting um, in a very close proximity um, to, to where humans congregate, they'll remove them and they'll kill them with uh, conventional insecticides, just as we would say a uh, true yellow jacket population. These are ground nesting yellow jackets. Um, you know, we treat them with a, uh, an insecticide or we dust their cavities um, with an insecticidal dust and it kills them. So Dr. Puckett, I, I, we've got one more question here and then I'll ask my question. It says, is there any public source, official public source that we can monitor on how Washington State's, uh, on Washington State's efforts are going? Yes, as a matter of fact, they have a website up and running and I don't know the web address, but I can find it real quick, I bet, as okay. we're talking. Okay. But if you Google on your own, Washington State, um, Department of Agriculture, um, Asian Giant Hornet, you will find links to that, that site. Okay. So while you're, while you're pulling that up, a question, you, you said that um, your colleague of, uh, over in Asia, in, in the country that, which he was referring to, he said, oh, they're everywhere. We just go outside, they're flying around everywhere. Well, um, you know, and it's certainly not being quite familiar with, with their insects over there necessarily, but I would assume that they have probably some, some do they have honeybees over there that <laughs> certainly if they're flying around like that, I wonder um, what the, how detrimental it is, because I'm sure that there's, there's plants and flowers over there that need to be pollinated, crops that need to be pollinated as well, so. That's right. So, so there's sort of, I've got a two-part answer to that. Okay. The reality is um, in some Asian countries, I'm working to get that web address up. In some Asian countries, they do utilize European honeybees as we do here. However, okay. there are other species of honeybees that are also used for uh, are relied upon for pollination services. Mm -hmm. Let me share my screen again. Or can, can you still see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so the interesting thing though is that um, those bees that are native to Asian countries are adapted to dealing with um, Asian giant hornets. And so they don't succumb to the effects of colony raids in the same way that our European honeybees do because they have a suite of, of uh, behavioral adaptations that allow them to deal with a raid by hornets. And so um, Japanese honeybees, for instance, when the hornets show up at a hive, remember I said this, so there's a scout that goes out and marks, marks the, the, the um, honeybee colony and then returns to its nest and drags workers, uh, other hornets back to the, the bee colony to begin the attack. Okay. So those bees know to recognize the scout and they will cluster around the scout and start to beat their wings. Um, they'll drag them into the colony and start beating their wings and it increases the temperature inside the colony over the critical thermal maxima of the hornet and the hornet dies. It's, it's, it's a really elegant system of colony defense by the bees. And so what that means is that the scout never gets to return and recruit its nest mates to the honeybee colony. But our European honeybees did not also adapt with the giant Asian hornet. So they don't have a means of responding as those Asian honeybees do. Well, now that's, that's truly amazing. And that's a really cool story. That, huh? That's just amazing how nature adapts. That, yeah. That's uh, truly learned something in, in my opinion, extraordinary today. <laughs> yeah. So here's that web address. I don't remember who asked the question about the um, Washington State website, but, but this is it. This is the address to that website. It's very long. Um, so if you don't have time to jot it down, the keywords I used to search were Washington State Department of Agriculture, Asian Giant Hornet. Okay. Sounds great. Uh, any natural predators to the, to the, Asian giant. I, I don't know if there's any over here as of yet, or have they got that far <laughs> in, in, re, in, in researching that? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know that they, they know enough yet about their associations with North American animals. Um, 
undoubtedly there are some in the in their native range um, and 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 undoubtedly there's also parasites that will attack them I suspect our strep sifter and parasites so it's a there's a there's an order of of uh, parasitic insects that specialize on social other social insects and so um, I suspect that they could be parasitized by strep sifterans, but I doubt they'll have much of an effect on their population. Okay. Well, um, we're, we had, tell you what, uh, Dr. Puckett, we, we're at 9.55. We're, we're 9, right on time. I can't believe it. I thought I was going to finish up short. No, we're rocking and rolling. We had some great, great questions. Does anyone yeah. else have anything else um, that, that you want to share? or ask and uh if if you wish you you can certainly reach out to dr puckett too i believe he's he's you know giving you his his information or reach out to us here and we can certainly contact him via through our our methods as well as well so anyway anytime uh, so, yeah very very well great comments in the in the chat and folks we so much appreciate you being here and i didn't mention it earlier i did type type it in uh we, we have your email address, um, and if it's not, we, if you'll put that email address in the chat in case we couldn't identify it on our, on our participant page, we'll send you a, we'd like to send you a quick little survey. It is just a nine question survey. It's really, really fast. So important that if you, if you would take just a little bit of your time um, and fill that out for us, get that back to us, and send it back to us. It really does help us with future programming as well. There's some opportunity for you to put some things on there. Uh, on things that maybe you'd like to learn more about in the future, uh, either referring to this to this program in particular or something else. Um, guarantee you, we can probably find the information for you and, and, and it's probably something that, that more than just one person needs to know about. So again, uh, Dr. Puckett, thanks again. Oh, for, you bet, you bet. Uh, for hospitality, this was great. And look look forward to hearing from me some more, uh, Robert, in the future. There'll be, um, probably do some other things as well. If we can you bet, that. anytime. Thank you guys for showing up. And, and as Philip said, those, those surveys are very, very important to us in terms of being able to uh, provide the best information possible um, Absolutely. in our program. So, so please take a minute and fill that out. All right. Thank you all. Y'all have a great end of your week. Everybody stay well. Yep. Bye, Dr. Puckett. Have a great day.